Medic 43, District 1, Engine 51, Response, Cardiac Arrest. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. This is Dr. Casey Patrick, and joining us today are our now regular guests, our clinical chief, Nick Smith, and our assistant medical director, Dr. Mike DePasquale. And today we're going to talk about the analgesia ladder as it exists here at MCHD. It's a pretty common medical director question. It comes up pretty repeatedly, and I believe it stems back from the fact that pain medication and pharmacology in paramedic school is taught individually and it's more difficult to answer the question of what's the right pain medication for a complex patient not an individual medication so to speak but you've got the whole box at your disposal you've got a complicated elderly patient with borderline vital signs with multiple medical problems multiple medication cross-reaction potentials What do we give? Altered patients, trauma patients, patients that are hard sticks, pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, all these things make analgesia in the field more complicated than a single drug in a single lecture in paramedic school. So we're gonna review some foundational pharmacology related to the analgesics we have on our trucks here at MCHD. For the listeners out there who have other medications, sorry, that's the quick We're gonna talk about our drugs alert for everybody. And before we get into the nuts and bolts, there is an elephant in this room, and that is the opiate epidemic as it exists in the United States today. And yes, we want to be mindful. If someone has a substance use disorder history, by all means, be thoughtful in the medications that you offer them, how you offer that to them in a humane and compassionate way, that's very important. Analgesia in this discussion does not mean opiates, opioids at max doses. We're not telling the MCHD medics that after this discussion, you've got to go give every single patient fentanyl to the max. But we want to consider our analgesia plan thoroughly in every single patient. That's a must. We have to believe our patients. We're not part of the pain police. That's not the approach that we want to use here at MCHD. If somebody tells me they're in pain, I'm gonna offer them analgesia. Going back to the point we just made, that doesn't mean that it always has to be max dose fentanyl. So on that theme, let's start with fentanyl, Chief Smith, and talk about our number one here at MCHD, probably Dr. DePasquale is, and myself's number one in the emergency department. Uh, let's open with fentanyl. Yeah, so fentanyl is our opioid of choice here at MCHD. So a reminder to the folks out there, opiate, we're looking at a natural derivative from the opium plant uh, versus opioid. You're looking at those uh, lab grown or synthetics, your tramadol, fentanyl, et cetera. Um, here at MCHD, we have a one microgram per kilogram dose for fentanyl, and that's a max single dose of 100 micrograms. So you're over 100 kilograms, uh, the max dose you're going to get is 100 micrograms. Uh, with that, it's an approximate 60 minutes of length of action. Uh, it's shorter acting and uh, it also provides less histamine release than morphine. Um, I know that uh, generally speaking, less histamine equivocates to less hypotension because of the mast cell activation and releases there. Um, most of the time for severe pre-hospital pain, our choice is going to be fentanyl. But if it's a trauma and we have borderline blood pressure, you know, we're, we're riding into the hypotensive area, uh, we want to look at utilizing ketamine. Uh, we love ketamine for pain here at MCHD. It really is a Swiss Army knife medication. Uh, we had a recent dose change to Um, really easy administration of it and hopefully look to decrease medication errors. We have a 20 milligram fixed dose, may repeat times one for adults, dose of ketamine for pain. There's a lot of good data out there at the 0.15 to 0.3 mg per kilo, uh, the sub-dissociative dose range for utilizing that for pain. We really want to consider this if uh, the patient has borderline or low blood pressure 
or as you mentioned earlier, a history of substance use disorder. Uh, and so I guess kind of transitioning from the more severe pain aspects, you know, Dr. De Pasquale, can you talk a little bit about the moderate pain, some of the Toradol versus acetaminophen considerations and debate there? Yeah, one thing I have to say I appreciate is uh, that our service here has other options outside of just fentanyl or opiates. Uh, when I was a medic, we didn't have that. The only option for pain control was fentanyl. So to have something in the middle there, Tylenol, Toradol, it gives the medics, I think, a good option to treat other types of pain that we don't want to necessarily give max dose fentanyl to, like we were just talking about, or other types like colicky pain where actually Toradol is better. Um, and so we here at MCHD have both oral and IV Tylenol as well as uh, Toradol. And uh, the dose, just to remind everybody that for Toradol is 15 milligrams IV, 30 milligrams IM. Uh, the dose for Tylenol is the same PO or IV. Uh, and in general for adults, it's going to be 1,000 milligrams. And for kiddos, it's 15 mg per kg, same as what we use in the hospital. Um, you know, I've heard some people talk about it's an emergency, we do EMS, people are getting hurt, and why are we giving them Tylenol? But the thing of it is that you don't necessarily need to give everybody opiates every time they get any kind of injury, and that uh, there is data that shows that uh, the max dose Tylenol, the full gram, does provide adequate analgesia in certain situations. And then especially when it comes to the Toradol, if you have somebody with kind of this colicky, renal pain, that sort of thing, if you think they have kidney stones, Toradol is a great option, and I would definitely start there first. Um, Toradol though does have some limitations. We don't want to use it in uh, elderly people, people who are known to have CKD or, or chronic kidney disease. It's not indicated in pediatrics. Um, but it is definitely a great option when the patient has that moderate level pain, they're a little uncomfortable, or if the patient is telling you, I really don't want the big drugs. You know, if you say the word fentanyl and their face changes because they watch television and they go, wow, I don't want fentanyl, you can offer them, well, what about we try with Toradol if, if they fit? And that makes a lot of sense to me. And that's, that's the way I practice in the ER too. You know, not everyone who has pain gets fentanyl, Toradol and Tylenol are good options. Um, we carry the IV formulation of Tylenol. It's come down significantly in price. Um, the biggest uh, deterrent I've heard from implementing this in the past has been that IV Tylenol is super expensive. I've heard from hundreds to thousands of dollars per doses before, and uh, we can just clear the air. It's not. It's it's like, what, 20 bucks, 15 bucks? And we're down below 10 now. Below $10. Right. So, I mean, it, it costs, I don't really think, is the big limiting factor here in implementation of the IV Tylenol. And in patients where they either can't take PO or there's some sort of other limiting factor giving an IV, doesn't break the bank and still gets the job done. So I think that that's a great option. Um, the other thing too is that um, Tylenol is, is kind of also bridges a gap in the limitations that we have from Toradol, where if they have kidney disease, you can still give them Tylenol. And in fact, you know, one of the biggest things I've heard from medics is, well, what if they have liver disease? And to be honest with you, e even the hepatologists will tell you that a single dose of Tylenol uh, to someone who with liver disease who is in pain or has fever is fine. It, it's not going to add insult to injury. You know, they shouldn't be on it chronically, but the one dose that they're going to get from us in the ambulance is, is not really a long-term issue. Um, so then the, the next issue is, oh, and the other thing about Tylenol too is that you can give it to pregnant people, right? So uh, Toradol and NSAIDs would not be indicated in pregnancy, but Tylenol is certainly okay. <laughs> it's really the only thing. <laughs> it's the only thing that's okay in pregnancy. Um, so the other question is then what becomes of uh, what if we can't get an IV? You know, how do we deal with uh, pain control? Now, Tylenol, of course, comes oral, um, same that you probably have at home. But another option that we have here at MCHD that I, I also really like is that we have uh, nitrous oxide. Um, that's 50-50, so 50% nitrous, 50% oxygen that, that we can give to patients. It's uh, patient controlled, um, and it's uh, rapid on and rapid off. They, the, the patient takes a breath, they get the effect, and when they don't want it anymore, they've had too much, they don't have to take any more of it. Um, the other things that we can do, and we've talked about on this podcast before my time here, but I've listened to the podcast, <laughs> is that uh, nebulized ketamine is an option for patients where you can't get an IV. Um, and if you're doing that, I would highly recommend that you have the breath actuated nebulizer so that not everyone in the back of the ambulance is experiencing the effects of the nebulized ketamine and only the patient. <laughs> Um, and then also, of course, there's like intranasal routes, intramuscular routes, as, you know, other options for non-IV administration. So all of those things are pretty fancy if you're interested in 
nitrous episode 119 if you're interested in nebulized ketamine episode 131 we've linked our acetaminophen and catorolac data from here at mchd in the show notes so plenty more to dig into there more than we want to discuss today and honestly stuff we've discussed before on the podcast but we've talked about fentanyl we've talked about ketamine we talked about iv tylenol nitrous oxide and the nitronox device but don't forget the basics not every scrape bruise or contusion needs iv analgesia and so this goes back to considering your total package pain control options and remembering that some of those things we learned way back in boy scouts and girl scouts first aid classes they help splinting ice positioning this applies to all of us emt amt medic physician there's a slide that I love to use in our pain talks with some rubber bands and some flavor ice popsicles used as a splint with the arm rested very nicely in the child's lap and so you have a splint you have some cold you have positioning and when you're all done you can eat the green one because they're the best Uh, (laughs) don't forget the basics and that's a very bad flavor ice joke there also pain comes with other symptoms and we know this kidney stone patient to go back to Uh, Dr. DePasquale's colicky pain in the kidney stone patients, they're always just supremely nauseated. Uh, Sometimes they can be very anxious, so don't forget your adjuncts to pain control. While it's not in our analgesia protocols, droperidol works pretty well in the ED for a lot of pain-adjacent conditions like nausea and anxiety, cyclic vomiting syndrome being a big one, Uh, chronic abdominal pain, migraines, a lot of things that come with nausea and anxiety and pain all wrapped up into one bundle. We do undertreat pain in EMS. We undertreat pain in the emergency department. We undertreat pain in the pediatric emergency department. There's loads of literature to support this. So that's really the point of this discussion is to remember all of our options. Intranasal inhaled medications, especially in kids, is a way that we can avoid the owie on top of the owie we don't like to take that crying kid with the deformed forearm and now we're going to put an iv in the other forearm like eh, do we really want to do that no we don't have to we can use nebulized ketamine we can use intranasal fentanyl we can use nitrous oxide all of those are really solid options for pediatric analgesia don't forget that the breath actuated nebulizer exists we don't want to spray the back of the truck with ketamine Uh, the mucosal atomizer device as well the mad device exists as well for intranasal meds when it comes to the question of well why do you have intranasal and nebulized ketamine i personally believe that most folks don't use the mad device quite correctly and it ends up being an intraoral ketamine dose Uh, and ketamine dosing and ketamine effectiveness is very related to the consistency of the uptake so if it's nebulized to me it gets to the lung tissue in a very neat and clean manner and so its uptake is nice and even and the analgesia uh, is better uh, through that route and there's actually some recent data that shows that nebulized ketamine as compared to IV ketamine in the emergency department works about the same the elderly population is another one worth mentioning before we wrap up and like anything in our elderly population our kidney function is likely going to be less than it was when we were young Uh, the effects from a mental status standpoint as far as confusion and respiratory depression those things are going to be more pronounced so go slow start low uh, avoid catorolac we don't want uh, catorolac in patients uh, greater than or equal to 70 sort of our elderly cutoff here at mchd so if you're 71 and you've got a kidney stone no catorolac here at mchd we don't know what that renal function is going to be we you know more likely to have stomach ulcers and other bleeding conditions more likely to be on anticoagulants so let's just steer clear there and in the elderly as well nebulized ketamine is another excellent option if the patient tells you hey they always have to use an ultrasound to get my iv in the er and their blood pressure is 95 over 60 and you don't want to bottom them out with iv fentanyl you don't want to make them sleepy or respiratory depressed with fentanyl consider uh, nebulized ketamine or in ketamine in those patients as well so before we wrap up what do you guys have yeah and, and i'll just add to that the nebulized ketamine really is a great choice um, probably underutilized a little bit in our service from the data that we've seen um, the biggest complaint that we've heard is centered around the flavor that comes from the nebulizer so 
To that end, I think if we're getting to the point of pain treatment where somebody's biggest concern is the, the flavor of the medication going in, <laughs> it's a pretty effective medication at treating their pain. Yeah, and no, we're not buying any pina colada flavor, flavored <laughs> ketamine, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> no cherry ketamine. And then if that is the complaint, then coach the patient, talk them through it, give them a little bit of uh, pep talk beforehand, and that goes a long way. Dr. De Pasquale, anything you want to add before we close the shop? I think the discussion on adjuncts is a big one, too, for musculoskeletal injury. I think a lot of people sometimes forget if you break your arm, it hurts. And if you splint it and have it nicely with an ice pack and put together nice so it's not bouncing around in the back of the ambulance, that helps a lot, too. And that probably helps a lot more than giving them the 50 or 100 of fentanyl while their arm bounces around. And I, I'm sure all of us have heard BLS before ALS, but in, in some sense, that's definitely true. In, in many things, honestly, when it comes to medicine in general, basics count first. And we can do a lot of fancy things with IVs and needles and stuff, but simply just making the thing that hurts move less, I think helps a lot and goes a long way to help with the analgesia. Then you put the cherry on top with some pain medicine and people feel better. That's a, that's a great point. You think about when you arrive on scene to somebody with an extremity injury, what are they doing? They're always self-splinting. Right. If they're conscious, they're self-splinting. They're holding their arm, their shoulder, their leg, their wrist. So for us to continue that treatment, in addition to the pain adjuncts with pain medication, is, that's a great point. Plus or minus ice pops. Yeah, well, green's the best flavor. Blue. Just, j just it's saying. Not, but that's okay. It's blue. Yeah, well, let's wrap it up <laughs> before we get into fist fight over flavor ices. Treat pain. Use your options. Be mindful. Believe our patients. Doesn't mean give one specific thing at a max dose. And no, we're not going to, uh, you know, come down hard on folks who don't max dose fentanyl. That's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about using all of our options. To Dr. De Pasquale's point, we have lots of them here, and they are for these specific reasons. When sometimes fentanyl is not the right choice, we have those those options there so that we can better serve our patients. Believe our patients when they tell us they're in pain. We're not the pain police. Analgesia does not equal opioids. Ketamine, ketamine for borderline blood pressure and trauma patients is one of the more common scenarios we get questions on. Patients in a rollover MVC, they've got an open tib fib. They've got a heart rate of 110 and a blood pressure of 100. A little shock index. GCS is 15, but how do we treat that pain? And First and foremost, let's get them positioned properly and splinted if we can. But 20 of ketamine is a really good option in that situation. And with that fixed dose, we're not calculating weight. Uh, we are trying to concentrate as much as we can on reducing those medication errors. The second group of patients I think we get the most questions on, and we'll say it one more time, and that is how do we treat pain in pregnant patients? And really, the safest option for us in the field is Tylenol. That's the one that is tried and true in preg pregnant patients. Now, if that pregnant patient has an open tib fib, then by all means, we're, we're gonna have to use opiates and that's just the way that it's gonna go, or our opioid, I should say, we're gonna have to use, use fentanyl in that situation. But for all the other mild to moderate situations where we don't want to use fentanyl, uh, Tylenol is the safest spot for us to land. No Ketorolac for the elderly, 70 or older, go a different direction. It can be a good intramuscular option for a 32-year-old with back pain that radiates to his groin that feels just like his kidney stone a year ago. Fire away with the clitorolac in that patient. But the 81-year-old with two weeks of low back pain, we need to go a different direction. Too much kidney, too much stomach, too much platelet compromise there. Last but not least, don't forget inhaled intranasal nebulized meds for kids. That's nitrous. That's nebulized ketamine. That's the MAD device. If you have questions, concerns, ideas for future podcasts, shoot us an email, podcast at mchd-tx.org. Follow us, subscribe, like, review, all of those things, wherever you watch or listen to your podcast. We appreciate the feedback, and we've gotten great episode ideas from our listeners. As always, thanks for listening. We'll be back with a new episode soon.